In this short video, we're going to look at differential equations as mathematical models for various physical phenomena. We're not going to try to solve those equations, but frankly, most of these equations you've already seen as early as in your algebra class when you're studying exponential functions, and certainly in second semester calculus. So that's the main reason that we're studying differential equations is because they can be used to modify physical, physical or real world phenomena. Well, for example, before we get there, uh, I want to make some two important notes. Um, these models all come from a reasonable set of assumptions and under those assumptions, they make sense. But even where they make sense, there are simply approximations which are good enough for the use case at hand. So some of the things that we've seen before, population dynamics, this simple model assumes that the uh, rate of change in the population is proportional to the amount of population that you have. So this neglects many things, if nothing else, the rate at which people die, uh, the rate that uh, people may enter or leave the population for other reasons. But this still is a valid model for growth of small populations over short time intervals. Uh, radioactive decay, this is a very good model uh, because it's decay, the uh, constant of proportionality K is going to be a negative number. Continuous compound interest, uh, hopefully we never get to see anything like this. It just says that if you understand the idea of compound interest, interest may be compounded quarterly, which means that they take the interest earned and add it uh, to the balance. Uh, if S represents the savings balance, then it gets added in. Um, if you do the compounding often, then the, the net growth rate uh, is going to be much larger than if you do it infrequently, like maybe once a year. Newton's law of cooling, this one is less common, but usually appears in a second semester calculus class. And this just says that the rate of change in the temperature of an object is going to be proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the medium, meaning what is surrounding that object. So it could be the air in the refrigerator, or if you dip it in some kind of liquid, whatever liquid that is, the temperature of the surroundings is what the T sub M stands for. A somewhat meaningful model would be the spread of disease. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions in these models. First of all, one thing that's different is you actually have two functions which depend on time. The first function x represents the number of people with disease and y represents the number of people not yet exposed. And there's two important assumptions. First of all, the first assumption, which seems reasonable, is that the uh, rate of change in the number of people with disease is proportional to the number of interactions between those who have the disease and those who have not been exposed. And the second assumption is that the number of interactions is jointly proportional with x and y, meaning that uh, it is proportional to the product x times y. Mixture problems you might have seen in second semester calculus. The idea here is that you have salt mixed in a tank. S the salt water is also called brine. So you have some other brine coming in the tank, it gets mixed thoroughly or mixed completely. And then the mi new mixture is then coming out of the tank. So the concentration of the brine coming in, we have a C sub in, 
with a rate or flow rate of r sub n and the same thing with the flow going out. And we use the capital A for the amount of salt in the tank, capital B is the volume of brine in the tank. And it's a very simple formula that the rate of change of salt in the tank is going to be the amount of salt entering the tank minus the amount of salt leaving the tank per unit time. So that would be, you would take your concentration coming in times the rate coming in minus the concentration going out minus the rate going out. And the concentration in is given the amount the concentration going out depends on the amount of salt in the tank and the volume that's in the tank. A different application, which you might not have seen, is uh, draining a tank through a sharp-edged hole. And it depends on uh, Torricelli's law, uh, which says that the speed of the water draining is going to be V equals radical 2 GH. G is our acceleration due to gravity. H is the height of the water in the tank. So normally we might want to solve this for uh, the height, how fast or at what rate of change is the height changing throughout time. And so we can easily find the rate of change of the volume uh, that it makes sense that it would be negative and you would just take the area of the hole times the rate at which water is leaving the tank, which is that velocity radical 2 gh. Now, if you have a nice cylinder, uh, or even if you have another shape where you can say that the volume is proportional uh, to the area of the water at time t times the height at times t, uh, the, the area of the surface of the water, then you can differentiate. And assuming that the uh, surface of the water is constant, you'll get a constant rate. It will not depend on t or h. Uh, then we can use the chain rule and get an expression for dh dt, which would be the ratio of the area of the hole over the area of the water times radical 2 gh. And of course, it's negative because the water, or the volume is, uh, the, I'm sorry, not the volume, the height is decreasing, just like the volume is. Another application is circuits. In fact, you could really base an entire differential equations class just based on studying circuits. So we will go back to these types of circuits. We're looking at circuits in series where we may have an inductor with inductance L, a resistor with resistance R, and a capacitor with capacitance C. And we have the impressed voltage measured here, E of T. So there's two functions that we may be referencing, the current and the charge. And there's a connection between these two in that uh, I of T is DQ DT. We're going to make use of Kirchhoff's second law, which says that the impressed voltage measured there at E of t on a closed loop must equal the sum of the voltage drops in the loop. So what are the voltage drops? Well, it depends on the components. If you have a capacitor, the voltage drop is 1 over C times Q. Q, remember, is the charge. For a resistor, it's I times R but I is also dq by dt. So it could be dq dt times r. 
And then for the inductor, the voltage drop is L times di dt, which would be L times the second derivative of the charge with respect to time. So if we put all that together with Kirchhoff's law, we get this second order differential equation. Now for falling bodies, again, this is an analysis that you have seen probably multiple times in an algebra class, maybe a basic physics class in calculus one. You start with uh, neglecting air resistance. And of course this should say resistance. So I'm gonna change that to say uh, resistance. And so what do you do? Uh, well, you uh, start with that the acceleration, which would be the second time derivative of the position vector, or the position function, is uh, minus g, acceleration due to gravity. Find the antiderivative, you'll get minus gt plus a constant c1. That gives you the first time derivative, which is also the velocity. Take the antiderivative again, you get this familiar equation here. How do we find out what C1 and C2 is? Well, normally what you're given are the initial conditions that S of zero equals S naught, and S prime of zero, which is V at zero, is V naught, and you get our very familiar differential equation, I'm sorry, position function for uh, an object falling, uh, neglecting air resistance. Well, what if we include air resistance? We're going to assume that that air resistance is proportional to V of T. When you assume that's proportional to V of T, uh, this is called viscous damping. So now you have two forces acting on this falling body. You have a force pulling down, which is just the force due to the acceleration of gravity. And you have a force pushing up, resisting that, that's the force due to uh, air resistance. And so we said, we said that's proportional to V. So that's why we have K times V. And Newton's second law tells us that the sum of those forces should be mass times acceleration. And again, acceleration is the second derivative of the position function. So now we have a new differential equation, including air resistance. So that's our introduction to mathematical models that give rise to differential equations. And uh, throughout the course, we'll actually learn how to solve some of these and we'll extend them to make them more realistic for different situations.